Throughout this crisis, we're being reminded that our state of the city is measured in the strength of our people. It's found in our willingness to give ourselves to the common good, in quiet acts of generosity that define our Angelino spirit. So much has changed in the last few weeks, but some things are always going to be with us. Our grit, our determination, our courage, and our compassion. That is what makes LA so special and so strong. And what I see every single day in folks who don't usually make headlines, heroes who are simply showing up for work, our firefighters and EMTs getting folks tested for COVID-19, our doctors and nurses treating patients and the technicians, custodians, and other workers who are keeping our hospitals open and running, our grocery workers and our truck drivers who are keeping our markets stocked, our shelves full, and our families fed, our manufacturers who are retooling assembly lines to produce face coverings and other supplies to keep us safe and to keep us healthy, our dock workers moving masks and protective equipment from the port to the front lines, and our public servants who are keeping our lights on, our water flowing, our streets clean, our garbage picked up, and our communities safe. And then there's all of us, picking up groceries for an elderly neighbor, giving what we can to food banks, to charities, helping the parents down the street who've lost jobs and had hours cut, and who aren't sure how they'll feed their kids or pay for next month's rent. And by staying safer at home, sacrificing work and study and recreation, even family and faith gatherings, every one of us is saving lives. This is who we are. And that's how we will get through this together. Our strength and our love, Los Angeles, that's how we protect our city today. So we can keep our eyes fixed where they'll always be in this destination of dreamers and doers on a stronger, more fair, and more just tomorrow. family welcome back to another amazing sunday service my name is nate harris i am your host but i want to ask you guys a question are you guys in a life group if you're not in a life group i really want you to ask yourself this question why am i not in a life group here at peace chapel we believe that our life groups are the foundation of our ministry the reason why i even became a member at this church was through life groups before i even attended any sunday service i got the opportunity to join the ironman's life group now I'm going to pick on the pastor for a second because typically we look at pastors like these perfect human beings. They never go through anything in life. They know Jesus the best. They know the Bible so well. They're just these perfect human beings and we put them on a pedestal. Now in this life group, I got the opportunity to learn the pastor, the human side of him, who he was as a person. And I started to learn that he goes through some of the same things that we all go through. At that time in my life, I was going through a lot of different things and sometimes in life we think that when we're going through things, we are the only ones who are going through these things. So not only did I learn that my pastor, somebody who typically we look at these perfect human beings, are going through some of the same issues that I was going through, I stopped beating myself up about it. Typically we beat ourselves up. Now I have a form to be able to express how I feel and be able to deal with the things that I'm going through in life. That's why we call it a life group. So if you're interested in joining one of these life groups, it literally can be transformational. It can change your life because it literally changed my life. I was a Christian throughout my whole entire life. I always followed Jesus. I always read my Bible, but I didn't really know. I didn't really follow and chase it as much as I did because of life groups here at Peace Shop. So if you're interested in joining one of these life groups, I promise you it can change your life. Please reach out to me, reach out to Pastor Fitz, reach out to Vern, any one of the leaders here at Peace Chapel. We can get you guys set up with one of the, our life groups that are going on throughout the week, or you can get one started. Right now, since we're in quarantine, clearly we are doing all of our life groups through Zoom, but this is actually amazing because when we get back to normal life, we can actually get our life groups going, but if you're busy and you can't make it after work or you have something that comes up, you can simply join through Zoom. So when we're in this time right now, we have to find all the beauties and, 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 and all the great things that can be found out throughout this quarantine. I love you guys. I know you guys are going to enjoy this service. Pastor has something cooked up for y'all, but enjoy. I love you, and I'll see you next time. Pray, worship, pray, worship, pray, worship, pray, worship, pray, worship, pray, worship, pray.
What's up, Peace Chapel? It's your pastor, DeAntoine Fitz, broadcasting here at the church house. Unfortunately, you guys are not here with me, and so I need to give you guys a big virtual hug. Can we do a virtual hug together? I want to give it up to our worship team, led by the talented and gifted Sean Brazell, the founder of WorshipJunkieRadio.com. You can catch him every single day, all throughout the day, at WorshipJunkieRadio.com. In fact, I'm wearing and sporting a worship junkie gear. He has a bunch of gear. He even has worship junkie masks. Also, I am on the radio show on Mondays at 6 p.m. And so I would love for you guys to tune in and check us out every Monday night at 6 p.m. Before we get started, I also want to give a shout out to a few people who are worshiping with us online right now. I want to give it up to Ashley McFarland. That's Israel, Isaiah's mom. She lives right down the street from the church. What's up, Ashley? I want to give it up for, uh, give it up to Michael Hodges from Chicago. He's worshiping with us live online. And then I want to give it up to my man, Herman McCullough, who's worshiping with us from Chino Hills, California. So as you guys know, we started a message series last Sunday entitled The Invisible War. It's a message series all about the invisible warfare. The president talked about this coronavirus and he labeled it an invisible enemy, meaning that we can't see it. It's spreading like crazy. People are getting contagious. They're getting infected by this virus, but we cannot see it. And so he called it an invisible enemy. And we Christians, we know something about invisible enemies. We know something about invisible wars. In fact, the Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but that our enemy is invisible. We cannot see him. And so he's real. Even though we cannot see him, he's real and he wreaks havoc on people. And he has invisible weapons that he shoots at people. And that's what we're talking about in this message series. We're talking about the invisible weapons that the enemy, Satan, uses to wreak havoc on God's people. Invisible weapons like fear, like worry, like anxiety. We talked about anxiety last week. We're going to talk about that some more today. Even depression. These are invisible weapons. Paul describes them as flaming arrows, right, that he shoots at people to wreak havoc. And even though we cannot see these weapons, we can certainly feel these weapons, right? You know what it's like to feel anxiety. You know what it's like to have your heart racing, You know what it's like to be sweating uncontrollably. You know what it's like to not be able to sleep at night. And so he has these invisible weapons that he shoots at people and it affects us physically. And so that's what we're dealing with in this message series. And so we're going to start the message series the same way that we started it last week. And we're dealing with anxiety. And I told you guys what anxiety is. I have a definition for anxiety. Anxiety is an uneasy feeling, agitation, dread, or fear about what may or may not happen. Another way of saying that is it's an unhealthy preoccupation with the future, right? And you're dealing with it right now. And so it's affecting you today, but it's something that may or may not happen. And what we learned last week is that the enemy does use anxiety. And anxiety can attack us. But what I pointed out to you guys last week is when anxiety attacks, don't drop your guards. That we have to keep our guards up. We have to protect ourselves. And we looked at two weapons that are very effective for us in this invisible war. We looked at Paul's letter and Paul gave us two weapons that we can use that are very effective in this invisible war. It's prayer and it's praise. That we have to pray and we have to praise. And prayer is us communicating to God and praises us thanking God for who he is and what he's done. And so the formula that the Apostle Paul gave us is that prayer plus praise is the pathway to peace. Prayer plus praise is the pathway to peace. And we have to utilize this formula. And so let's look at Paul's letter again to the Philippian church. Now, mind you, Paul is writing this letter 
on house arrest. He had a desire to get to Rome to preach the gospel because Rome was a major population hub, and it gave Paul the best chance of accomplishing his goal of spreading the gospel throughout all of the world. And so Paul is writing this letter to a group of people who have plenty to be anxious about, but here's what he says, and remind you, I want to remind you that Paul is writing this letter on house arrest. He says this, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And he repeats it. He says, I'll say it again, rejoice, because he really wanted us to get this. And what Paul means when he says rejoice, I pointed out to you guys last week, that means to be full of joy. And we're full of joy as as Christians. We should be full of joy always, not because of what's going on around us, because oftentimes when we look at what's going on around us, it's not a reason to rejoice. But Paul is saying, and he's writing this from prison, he's saying that we need to rejoice and be full of joy because we belong to the Lord. And then he says in verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. In other words, when people on the outside are looking in at what's going on in your life, they should see you maintaining your faith. They should see you keeping your faith and holding firm to your faith. And he says, he says the reason why is because the Lord is near. And that's what we're going to deal with today. He says the Lord is near. And then he challenges us. And this is a command. He writes this in the imperative. In verse 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Car note do, don't be anxious. Sickness in your body, don't be anxious, right? And that's a lot easier said than done. He says, but in every situation, instead of being anxious, he says, but in every situation, by prayer... And petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, in context, prayer is presenting our request to God, letting God know what we need. He says with prayer and petition, he says with thanksgiving, that's praise. He's talking about thanking God for what he has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. And here's the result. Paul says, and the peace of God, that's what you want, right? What you feel right now is panic. But what you really want is the peace of God. He says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding. That when people are looking at what's going on in your life and the fact that you're maintaining your peace, they're perplexed. And they don't understand how you're maintaining your peace. And he says this peace will guard our hearts and our minds. Now, mind you, that's exactly where the enemy attacks. He tries to attack us in the way that we think and in the way that we feel. And Paul is saying this peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard our minds and our hearts. It will guard the way that we think, and it will guard the way that we feel. It's impossible to pray to God and praise God and still feel anxiety. We have to choose, right? And so I'm labeling and entitling today's message, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are near to us, Lord. And it doesn't always feel like you're near to us, Lord. But regardless of how we feel, you are near. You've been there for us all throughout our lives. The fact that we're here today watching this broadcast today, is a, it's evidence that you are with us, Lord. And so help those who are listening today to recognize that you are near. Now, what we're going to do today, we're going to have a little fun. We're going to look at an Old Testament passage of Scripture 
And we're going to look at a prophet, an Old Testament prophet. And for those of you who don't know, a prophet was one who spoke on behalf of God. And so prophets had close relationships with God. And they would often speak to the people and they would speak to kings on behalf of God and they would speak judgment, they would speak warning. And so they had a tough job, but they maintained this close relationship with God. And so the prophet that we're going to look at today is the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Elijah. And the story is found in 1 Kings chapter 19. Now the prophet Elijah perform more miracles than anybody in the Bible other than Jesus and his protege, Elisha. And what God would do to validate the prophet is he would, he would allow the prophet to do miraculous things. And Elijah did some very, very miraculous things. We see a story of him with a widow who was all out of food, and Elijah performed a miracle, and God turned what she had into more than enough. We see when Elijah was running, and all the prophets of God were running, that God was continuing to provide for Elijah, and he provided for him through ravens. We see the, oper- the, the time when Elijah raised the widow's son from the dead. But I want to call your attention to a showdown that takes place on Mount Carmel. Now, the king during the time of Elijah's time and the time of the story that we're going to look at today is a guy by the name of Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so Elijah had the responsibility of letting him know that God was not pleased with the way that he was operating. And Ahab didn't like that. Ahab had a wife named Jezebel. She was a bad booger. If you got a daughter, if if you're pregnant and you're pregnant with a girl, don't name her Jezebel. That's not a good name to name your daughter. Well, anyway, Elijah proclaims to them that God is not pleased with how they're leading the nation. And so because of that, they have issue with Elijah. And so Elijah comes to them and he says, look, He says, call all of the nation together. I want everybody to come out together, and I want all of the prophets to come out together as well. And I I want the prophets of Baal, and I'm going to be there, and I I I want there to be a showdown. And so there's a showdown that takes place on Mount Carmel. What Elijah tells them, he says, look, here's what we're going to do. I want you, the prophets of Baal, there are 450 of you guys, I want you guys to build an altar to Baal. And I want you to worship Baal. And I'm going to build an altar to Yahweh, the true God. And whoever, whoever God responds with fire, that is the true God. And so Elijah says, There are 450 of you guys. There's one of me, so you guys go first. And they're there, and they're chanting, and they're praying to their gods, the gods of Baal, and nothing is happening. And Elijah begins to mock them. He says, what's going on with your gods? Are they sleeping? He even says, are they in the bathroom? And so he's mocking them, and nothing happens. And now it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah has his altar there, and he begins to pray to Yahweh, the God of the universe, and God responds with fire. And so as a result, it amazes all of the people. There's this great big fireworks show on Mount Carmel. It amazes all of the people, and Elijah then kills all 450 of the Baal prophets with a sword. He stood up, this man stood up to 450 prophets. I've stood up to some people before, and people are are oftentimes intimidated by me because of my size. I'm six foot four, and I'm close to 300 pounds, and so my size sometimes will intimidate people. I've stood up to three people, four people, but I've never stood up to 450 people. Elijah stood up to 450 people, and so I want to pick up our story after that story in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1. It says this, Now Ahab told Jezebel, Ahab is the king of Israel, he told Jezebel, that's his wife, he's sort of a puppet king, he's telling his wife, he he told her everything Elijah had done and how Elijah had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
Verse 2, so Jezebel sent messenger to Elijah to say, listen to this, may the gods, plural, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. In other words, I swear to God, I'm getting ready to kill you, Elijah. Now, for those of us who know what God has done in Elijah's life, how God had worked all of these miracles, we're thinking in our mind, like, okay, no big deal. Elijah's getting ready to respond with courage. Like, bring it on. Bring it on, Jezebel. But here's how Elijah responds in verse 3. The text tells us that Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, if you and I were looking at the events of Elijah's life and this threat that he's faced with right now, we would say, what's going on with you, Elijah? Why are you running? I mean, do you not remember all the wonderful and powerful things that God has done through you and in your life? But I want you to think about your life and the thing that has you anxious and the thing that has you worried. If I was to peer into your life and examine your life and look at all of the wonderful, powerful things that God has done in your life, I would be wondering the same thing. And so in verse 3, the text continues, when he came to Beersheba, this is Elijah, he's running. I mean, he's scared and he's running. And that's what happens when anxiety hits us. It throws us off. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And so now his anxiety is turning into depression. He left his servant there. He's already been traveling. He left his servant there, and now he's all alone in the wilderness. The text tells us he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. Now look at how anxiety and fear, these invisible weapons that the enemy uses, look at how it renders us off. It causes us to be off and renders us irrational. He's not even thinking right. He's running from Jezebel thinking that she's trying to kill him, but he's praying at the broom bush that he might die. It doesn't even make sense. And that's what happens when we're filled with anxiety and controlled by fear. We do things that don't make sense. Verse 5 tells us all at once. Now he's laying there under the broom bush. Verse 5 tells us all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Now notice, the angel didn't say get up and pray. The angel didn't say get up and read some Bible verses. The angel said get up and eat. Sometimes we over-spiritualize things. We think that people need prayer when people need food. And so the text tells us in verse 6, he looked around and there by his head some bread baked over, baked over coals and a jar of water, he ate and drank and lay down again. Now depression is kicking in, and that's what happens when you begin to get depressed. You start to get tired, and you start to lose your energy. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for this journey is too much. For you. you need some food in your body. You need some food because that food is going to provide energy for you. This journey is too much for you. Verse 8, so he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled. Listen to this. He's all over the place. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horab, the mountain of God. This is the same place where Moses saw the burning bush that was burning and it wouldn't go out. It's the same place where Moses went up on the mountain in Mount Sinai and the Lord gave him the Ten Commandments. In Elijah's mind, he's trying to get as close as he can to God so that he can die. He's irrational. He's not operating right. He's not thinking right because The enemy has hit him with his assaults, and now he's off balance. Verse 9 says, 
There he went into a cave and spent the night. Elijah is becoming depressed. If we don't deal with our anxiety, it can lead to depression. The text says, and the word of the Lord came to him. Listen to this. This is so powerful. The word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is not where I left you. This is not where I led you. What are you doing here? Do you remember all the things that took place at Mount Carmel, the fireworks show? Do you not remember all of the miracles? What are you doing here? I left you here and you're here. What are you doing here? And this is a question that that some of you need to ask yourself that, you know, what are you doing here? You've seen all of God's work in your life. You've seen God make a way out of no way. You've seen God keep you and protect you from danger seen and unseen. How did you go from where you were to where you are? See, if we're not careful... We'll allow fear and anxiety to lead us to a place where God doesn't want us. If we're not careful, we'll allow fear and anxiety to lead us right into an addiction. If we're not careful, we'll allow fear and anxiety to lead us right into an affair. If we're not careful, we'll allow fear and anxiety to lead us right into a bad, shady business deal. What are you doing Here, listen to how Elijah responds in verse 10. I've been zealous. It's like he gives the Lord this sad excuse, and and we do that sometimes. And I don't want to be insensitive about what you're going through. I struggle with anxiety, too. I told you guys my story last week. But he gives the Lord this, this sad excuse. He says, I've been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. Your people have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they've put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He gives the Lord this sad, sad story. So Elijah's in a bad place. Some of you who are watching this broadcast, you're in a bad place. You've allowed anxiety, the fear of what may or may not happen, to lead you to a place that God never intended for you to be. And so let's look at Elijah's mistakes, and perhaps you've made similar mistakes. Let's look at four of Elijah's mistakes. The first mistake that Elijah made was he dropped his guards. See, we can't look at this whole coronavirus thing that's going on right now. We can't look at that as being the only reason why we pray, right? I told you guys to keep your guards up. Prayer plus praise is a pathway to peace. But we can never drop our guards. When the Lord heals the land, we still got to keep up prayer. We still got to keep up praise. I've always talked to you, Peace Chapel, about the importance of daily quiet time. I've always talked to you about the importance of meeting with God and building on your relationship with God. That you should make it a habit of meeting with God before you meet with anyone else. Your meeting with God should be priority in your life. Because that's what prepares you for your day. And so we don't want to drop our guards when things start to get back closer to normal. We want to continue with our prayer lines. We want to continue to praise God and thank him for what he's done and what he's doing and what he's going to do. Prayer plus praise. We cannot ever drop our guards. And so you have to make your quiet time, your time with God, a priority. That's so important. There's nothing more important for you than your time with God. The Bible talks about our lives being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the way that we renew our minds is by spending time with God. And so Elijah 
He dropped his guards. The second mistake Elijah made was he tried to roll solo. And that's what a lot of you are doing. You're trying to roll solo. You're trying to do this thing all by yourself. I know we don't want people to know that we're going through what we're going through. And so we're private people and we're trying to handle this thing on our own. But God never designed for us to handle this thing on our own. He left his servant there and he went into the wilderness. He set himself up to be further attacked by the enemy by being by himself. That's why I'm always pushing and encouraging you to be in a life group, that you need to be in a life group because you cannot get everything that you need just from gathering together with people on Sundays. Isn't it interesting that God has taken that away from us? To gather together with the saints is no longer an option to gather together in buildings because we can't get together with more than 10 people because of this invisible enemy, COVID-19. And so now we're, we're forced to deal with a small group of people. And that's what I've always been encouraging you to do, to be in a life group, that real life happens in smaller environments, not bigger environments. We can hide in the crowd. He tried to roll solo. You can't do this thing on your own. That's why the Bible always talks about so many commands that we cannot fulfill on our own, one another. You have to love one another. You can't just do that by yourself. Be patient with one another. You can't do that by yourself. He tried to roll solo. If you're trying to roll solo and you're trying to handle your anxiety on your own, you're setting yourself up for failure. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. You need a circle of people, small group of people, that you allow to speak God's truth into your life. You can't do this thing on your own. Third mistake that Elijah made was he became preoccupied with the threat. He consumed himself with it, right? He started thinking more about the threat than anything else, and he started to exaggerate the threat. If you know how to worry, you should know how to meditate. And I'm a champion for meditation. There's nothing that impacts my emotions in a positive way like meditating. I did it three times today. Every time I feel myself getting anxious, I meditate. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Meditating, worrying is you're pondering over the threat, what might happen. Meditating is you're pondering over God's truth. You need to meditate on God's truth. And then you could be like the psalmist in Psalm 1, who is like a tree that's planted by streams of water. Whatever you do, you prosper. You bear fruit in season and out of season. You can have control of your emotions when you learn to meditate. Eastern meditation is emptying your mind of everything. Biblical Christian meditation is filling your mind with God's truth. That'll help you when you feel yourself becoming preoccupied by the threat. What may or may not happen? Am I going to get this virus? Will my children be hurt? Is he going to walk out on me? Is the stock market going to crash? Am I going to lose all of my money? So you can't become preoccupied by the threat. You have to meditate on God's truth. Fourth mistake that Elijah made was that he feared the threat more than he trusted in God's faithfulness. How could Elijah forget how faithful God has been to him? That God is always there. God has always been there. God is faithful. He's running, trying to get close to God so that he can die. And God is with him all along the way. God was there when Jezebel issued a threat. God was there when he laid under the broom bush and he began to worry and fall into depression and praying and asking that he would die, that God, that he could die. God was the one that sent the angel to wake him up and tell him to eat. God was the one who provided the food for him to eat. How did he forget God's faithfulness? That's what the enemy likes to do. He likes to get us to focus so much on the threat that we forget that God is faithful. God is always there. I grew up in this neighborhood. Most of you who are watching today, you know I grew up in this neighborhood. And I used to terrorize this neighborhood. And we had enemies on the other side and other neighborhoods. And I remember walking down the street right outside the church. On my way to 76 in Avalon, we were getting ready to get on the bus, me and one of my boys. 
And I remember one of the guys that we didn't get along with pulled up on 76 in his car, getting ready to turn left on Avalon. And he's seen us. And we going at it. We talking to him. He's talking to us. Next thing I know, he pulls out a nine millimeter Glock and he points it at us. And I turn and I run and I hear shots fired. And I told my friend, I said, I think I got shot. And I remember him turning left on Avalon. And he was getting ready to finish me off. And there was a bus going northbound on Avalon. And I turned, I'd already been shot. I turned and I ran with that bus and that bus shielded me. If that bus wasn't there, he would have killed me. When I think back over that, that was God's faithfulness. Wherever you are, where you're watch, wherever you are watching this broadcast, on your couch, in your bed, in your car, you have to remind yourself that God is faithful. He's been there all along. And so the Lord said to Elijah, back to our story in verse 11, go out and stand on the mountain. He's having this conversation with God now. In the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This is amazing. The Lord's getting ready to blow his mind. Verse 11, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. It's almost like God is showing out. It's like God is playing with him to show him the power that he has over all of creation. It says the Lord was not in the wind. But he told him to go stand out there. He knew it was going to happen. The story continues. After the wind, there was an earthquake. You guys here in California, we know something about earthquakes. Late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, we felt that earthquake. An earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. God is just playing around. It's like God is just showing out. And then after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire came a gentle whisper, a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave where God told him to go in the first place. And the voice said to him, again, the same question, what are you doing here? How did you allow the threats or the possibility of what might happen tomorrow to drive you here, Elijah? I get it. I get it that you, you know, I can understand if there was no me, but I'm here. So how did you allow that to get you here? And then he gives the Lord this same, it's like he rehearses this thing, right? He gives the Lord this same excuse that they were trying to kill us, and there's, you know, they, they killed all of the prophets of God, and I'm the only one left. He gives the Lord this same sad excuse. And look at how God responds to him. The Lord said, go back to the way that you came. You see that? All of that traveling that he did, he says, go back to the way that you came. You got to go back to what you ran away from. That thing that threw you off, you got to go back to what you ran away from. And the Lord tells him, he says, look, I want you to anoint a new king for the southern kingdom, a new king for the northern kingdom, and I want you to anoint Elisha to be your replacement. He says, yet, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouth have not kissed him. Elijah thought he was the only one. And so I can imagine Elijah at that point in time, like, wait a minute, so you mean to tell me that you had a plan all along? Yeah. You mean to tell me, God, that you had this thing figured out, you knew how it was going to turn out, and and, and I did all of this anxiety stuff, and and I was all off for nothing? Yeah. But why did God respond with a whisper. Why not 
in the wind? Why not in the earthquake? Why not in the fire? Why did God respond with a whisper? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, and I want you to put this in the comment section. Because the Lord is near. He doesn't need to make a lot of noise because he's near. That's why he whispered. He's always there. He's always been there. The enemy wants you to believe that he's not. The enemy wants you to believe that God has abandoned you. And that's what anxiety does. Anxiety today will cause us to doubt whether God will be there tomorrow. You need to write that down. Anxiety today will cause us to doubt whether God will be there tomorrow. So as we wrap this thing up, let me give you an application. You ready for an application? One application. We only have one application. If you're taking notes, you need to write this down. Here's your application. You do what you know you need to do today and trust God with tomorrow. It's just that simple. You do what you know you need to do today and you trust God with tomorrow. Now, I know this is a lot easier said than done. What motivated this message series was my anxiety. And I can preach the, the, the best messages I preach are messages that have something to do with what I experience. And so I want to pray for you because I recognize how challenging it is when we look at what's going on around us. We begin to fear what could happen tomorrow, and I've been there. And Elijah, he worried for nothing. The very thing that he feared would happen never ended up happening because Elijah never died. He's one of the few people in the Bible that we see that never died. And so he was anxious for nothing. I've been there where I thought that I was going to die. I didn't die. It was for nothing. I thought something was going to happen to my children. It didn't happen to them. It was for nothing. I thought I was going to get exposed. It didn't happen. It was was for nothing. I was anxious for nothing. So I want to pray for you because I realize that the enemy's attacks are real. And even though we cannot see them, we can feel them. And my heart goes out to everyone that's struggling with anxiety. This is serious stuff. So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, you've commanded that we rejoice always. You've commanded that we let our gentleness be known to all. You commanded that we don't be anxious about anything. But instead of reacting, we are to respond with prayer and with praise. And so I'm praying for my brother, my sister who's watching this broadcast, who's struggling with anxiety right now, I'm praying that you will help them to experience your peace, which surpasses all understanding. And I want to pray for those who don't know you as Savior. I pray that today will be the day of salvation. If you're watching this broadcast and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to confess that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. And ask him to come into your life. Trust his finished work on the cross as the full and final payment for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Father, for salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer with us, I want to welcome you into the family of God. What you did was more than enough. You don't have to jump through hoops. Salvation is free. It is by grace that we have been saved. It is a gift from God. And so you are saved, and now what you need is a church home. And so we want to help you. And so what I'm asking you to do is I need you to text Peace Chapel to 31996. Peace Chapel to 31996, and you should get a response. And we're going to walk with you and help you to take that next step. The other thing that I want you to do, and everybody that's watching this broadcast, is I want you to hit that subscribe button below. And then there's a notification bell right next to that so that you can be up to date on all of the content that we're dropping all throughout the week. We're dropping new content 
almost every day. And so we want you to be notified. And then I want to ask those of you who are not giving to Peace Chapel that you would pray about giving to our ministry. I want to thank those who are giving. God bless you. I pray that God will return it 50 and even 100 fold. Your gift is helping our ministry to continue. But those of you who are not giving, I want to pray. I want you to pray about giving because, again, our ministry is about kingdom building. We are right there every single day contact, in contact with people who are in need. We're feeding people every day here at the church from 4 to 6. And so when you give to Peace Chapel, you're giving through Peace Chapel. And we want to take this ministry globally. We want other people to hear the good news of the gospel. And so your gift of any size will help us to further God's kingdom all throughout the globe. So I want us to pray together and we're going to worship together. May the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each one of us until we meet again. And all of God's people said, Amen. Peace Chapel, let's worship together. God bless you. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making